Hello all, my name is Felice Cleveland and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston. I'm so grateful to you all for joining us for this timely and important conversation regarding the role and responsibility that artists play in civic issues, including encouraging participation in the census and voting. CAM stores are still closed, but we look forward to welcoming you back soon. Our role as a contemporary arts museum is to showcase artists and the issues they care about. This summer, we launched a new initiative called Beyond CAM. I think that we're gonna be able to see it in a moment on our website. It's an ongoing series of public art projects and partnerships beyond our walls. One of the first projects of this initiative was the work Accounting by Ekene Ijioma. And this work is a voice portrait of Houston. Thinking about the census, but also representation, marginalization, immigration, migration, and who is counted. This work invites everyone to participate and is perfect for these socially distanced times. We would encourage all of you to call in to the number that you're gonna see on the screen and count from one to 100 in your native language. Doesn't matter if your language is already a part of the project, we still want your voice and accent to be counted and included. If you don't live in Houston, that's okay. You can still participate in the project by transcribing some of the voices that have been recorded so they can be part of the project. A few housekeeping items before we get started. We encourage questions and engagement. Feel free to leave questions in the comments section of Facebook or YouTube, and we can make sure to get those to our panelists. We hugely appreciate your participation in this program, which we are able to host through generous donations from folks like you. I would encourage all of you to consider a donation to CAM, which you can do today by texting GIVE to 713-804-4714 or by going to our website and clicking GIVE and donate. This program is also funded in part by the city of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance. So a huge thank you to them for their support. Now, on with the program. I'm so honored tonight to be joined by four amazing women who are doing such important work in the Houston community. We're going to learn a little bit about each of them and discuss how they are promoting civic engagement and the work they believe that artists play in this work. First up is Nabila Mansour. She's currently leading the Empowering Communities Initiative 2020 to ensure a full count of Houston in the census. Texas's Asian American and Pacific Islander population and facilitates, excuse me, co-chairs the city of Houston and Harris County's complete count committee and community subcommittee. She also serves as the executive director of Engage, a civic engagement organization committed to politically engaging Houston's Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. Next, we have Rila, Ria Sampilo. Ria is a Filipina American, a creative and community organizer residing in Houston. She holds a bachelor's degree in sociology and a master's in performance studies. She is currently the co-president of the Filipino American Unity for Progress and works in close collaboration with Filipinex Artists of Houston, the Filipino American National Historical Society and OCA Greater Houston to program events for the Filipinex American and AAPI community in Houston. Next, we have Dr. Aisha Siddiqui, who is the founder and executive director of Culture of Health Advancing Together, or CHAP. She was born and raised in Pakistan, and while working on her doctoral degree, she sought out South Asian women to better understand their challenges and staying healthy. Dr. Siddiqui founded CHAT with a mission to foster the health and well being of immigrant and refugee communities through education, arts, advocacy, and access to care. Currently, Dr. Siddiqui and her team are actively involved with the census through community engagement. And last but definitely not least, we have Crystal Yancey. Crystal is a creative and writer and artivist from Houston. Over the last several years, she has served her community working with nonprofits here in the Houston area. She has her bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Houston Clear Lake, and Crystal vows to use her gifts to inspire black youth and young adults through her stories of faith, purpose, and life experiences. Thank you to all 
for your patience with that long but important intro I'd like to dive in. The census has been in the news and has been a long court battle. Where do things stand today? I thought that Nabila, you could start us off. Yes, um, well, first of all, thank you so much to Cam for putting this together. Um, it is such an honor to be on this panel with these wonderful women. Can I just make a shout out? We're an all woman panel. We represent all these different backgrounds. Um, oftentimes I'm the only woman on a panel with a lot of men. So this is just so refreshing. Um, and then it's very exciting for me because um, I have so much admiration for artists. And here I am on a panel for like a contemporary arts museum. So I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but I hope I have something insightful to offer. Um, so the census, I know it's been in the news a lot. And uh, the reason is um, the census has had its challenges this year. Uh, there have been many lawsuits. Um, it's been shortened, the timeline. I was originally supposed to go all the way to the end of October. Um, this administration uh, has, in, in particular, not wanted to count certain communities. And what communities are those? The ones that need to be counted the most. And, and so uh, I think this is actually the perfect day to do this because today is the last day for the census. This is the last opportunity for all of us to get counted. So you'll see on the bottom, there's a banner. Um, if you have not responded to the census, you still have today to go to my2020census.gov and you can just respond online, it takes less than 10 minutes. But what does it do? What, by you responding, by your families responding, what happens is you are able to get the funding, the political power, the ability to decide, um, uh, to get your voice heard, and, much in the way that we talk about voting uh, is through the census. And, and, and if we don't, and um, you know, we just got the, I just got the latest figures for the census response rate for Harris County and for Texas. Um, it means that there are gonna be many communities that are going to miss out. Um, and these are the communities that probably need that funding the most. Right now, the Supreme Court has said that October 15th is the last deadline. Um, what we are trying to do is uh, encourage our, our con congressional leaders to um, put an extension to the census. Uh, we don't believe you can get a fair and accurate count uh, with that December 31st deadline, which is looming, which is when the Census Bureau has to hand in um, all of their analysis and data and basically their final report. So this is a work in progress. This isn't over. Um, this shortened timeline has real repercussions and we don't get a chance to do this again until another 10 years. So that's why I think it's really precipitous that we, here we are in the first week of early voting, the last day of the census, and we're talking about how important it is that all of us count. Every immigrant, every refugee, every American citizen, young, old, all of us. And I'll let someone else kind of go chime in. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Please, anybody else jump in. I just wanted to add that it's so unfortunate that census today is the last day and you're very right that this is a great day to have this discussion and early voting is going on. But the unfortunate truth is that those who really need to get this message probably are not are not seeing right. this Facebook Live, this live stream, because we chat works with the community that is um, that needs to be counted that was mostly impacted by covid that is always not counted but at, again they are the ones who are at the have the short end of the stick and unfortunately they will still be uh, not uh, they will not be seeing this they don't know that today is the last day and then it's just like but by cutting it short there is a huge disadvantage for the community that need to be counted because said chat was involved with the phone banking and actively doing census and we are we, we are really sad that this happened i also want to reiterate um thank you nabila for that like 
just the emphasis that this information is going to be used for the next 10 years. And so um, being counted now, um, again, will affect the businesses that you'll see in your area. It would also affect um, especially like relief efforts as well. So I know that we're still in hurricane season. If we're not counted, um, we need to get to those communities in, in, communities in need, excuse me. And so um, that, those are like the one of many things that um, the census like uh, impacts. Um, also, it is it also determines the how many seats each state each state gets um, for the U.S. House of Representatives. So the more you know we're counted, the more seats we get in the House of Representatives. So um, I wanted to add to you uh, what you guys said. It's very important. I know being uh, African American, there's been so many different conversations around the census. Something including um, it being a hoax, or it's it's something. Uh, it's a, another motive, and we've suffered a lot, and um, especially in the third war and fifth war community. And it's very important. It's so important that if we want to change the environment and and change the businesses and change the things that we see, we have to do our part by doing the census. It literally takes five minutes. Like it's so simple, so easy. I thought it was going to be this long process, and it's not. And I really, um, it's quite disturbing that for something to be so important for the next ten years of generations of people's lives of legacy that it's just cut off to the fifteenth. Um, so, however, you need to spread the word. People that are watching, please, please, please spread the word. Please fill out the census. It really is important. It sets us up for education, um, resources. There's a lot of things, uh, a lot of things that are needed in in underprivileged, and underserved communities, especially here in Houston. Um, so, I encourage you all to please take the census very, very seriously. This is the last day. And it's also the voice of people who cannot vote. So yes, we raise our voice by the vote, but this is the voice of people who cannot vote. So it is very, very important to count those who otherwise wouldn't be counted. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, point, Dr. Siddiqui. I think that's why I really enjoyed this work as well. Um, so a lot of my work is about trying to empower communities to uh, get politically active. And then oftentimes the response I get is, especially the communities that I serve, oh, I'm not a citizen, I'm just a green card holder, or I don't have, but with the census, it was everyone, right? This is the opportunity for everyone to get their voice heard, which I think really ties in nicely to the wonderful art project uh, that this panel is tied with. Um, and so it's it's a shame that it, it had to end early. I don't think the story's over. I think if we can um, continue to push our legislators to um, maybe extend the census, maybe do something. Look, this is a constitutional right. We do it every 10 years, but it doesn't say that we can't do it every 11 years. So I don't know. I'm optimistic. I think there's um, uh, going to be enough of a political push in order to make it happen. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're we're in election season right now. Um, and I don't know about you, but I am really disheartened to see some of these really long lines and voting booths. Um, we know that the census in, is inextricably tied to also voting rights. And when we have activists that talk about why these polling locations um, being shut down or why there were so many lines and trying to argue of why things need to change. You know what they look to? They look to census data. And that's how they prove that this was a community that had this many African-American citizens and there was only this many polling locations. But if that data does not accurately reflect that community, then it really makes it hard for those activists to do their job. So it's almost like it's all interconnected. Uh, I always said, you know, the census is power. And by not responding to the census, just like not voting, it's almost like giving away your power. True, true. And I know as in terms of accessibility, I know that you can call um, to also, um, if those language barriers, right? Like that's, there, there are lines to call to help you walk through the census. If, if your native language, language is Tagalog, Urdu, 
um, there is someone to help you with that as well. Thank you all so much for that. Um, I appreciate your passion and you know putting the weight of how important it is in this moment. Um, just bringing it back a little bit to the project accounting and really thinking about artists. I'm curious to hear how all of you um, as community organizers and Crystal, especially you as more of an artist and artivist, really are engaging, you know, and thinking about this cross section and how um, art and community engagement come together. I'd love to hear about any projects or successes that you've had or challenges um, in that work. Thank you. Uh, so right now, um, I would say last week I worked with, uh, was it, I worked with Writers Block to host an open mic uh, encouraging people to fill out the census as well as using their voice to vote. Um, poetry is a is such a powerful tool. Um, it's something that has been done for years and ages uh, to engage people to speak from an emotional uh, standpoint as well as using all elements of the arts. I believe every element of the art is a universal language from graffiti to painting, sculpting, um, different types styles of poetry. And for me, I know I'm using my voice through uh, poetry and visuals to encourage people to vote and pointing out certain issues that are going on. Like right now, this is a month for human trafficking. So I'll be working on a project for that and, and using poetry to talk about protecting our kids, protecting our women. That is a huge issue going on right now. And I don't believe that's being pushed uh, as, much as, as much as it could be. Um, I believe that with using the arts, it's a it's a common ground that everyone can relate to. Sometimes when you talk about politics, it immediately sends people off. You know, I'm either Republican or Democratic. This is who I like, what I don't like, and we need to be able to talk about these issues regardless of what side that you're on. So I believe when we use our our arts. Um, we are able to clearly define our voice and at least allow the conversation to be had. Um, I've worked with organizations like Writers Block and Mi Familia Volta um, early this year. Woo -woo! <laughs> uh, uh, we did the climate uh, summit in February. And um, as an artist, it's fun to be able to express yourself without necessarily being judged so harshly, but it encourages people to just listen to what's being said, listen to what's really going on. Maybe you don't know something, but if you hear the emotional intensity in someone's voice or looking at the, the artwork, you'll understand how important it is of whatever issue they're addressing. So especially with everything going on right now with the pandemic, with the election, um, it's just, it's a lot. And it's been a lot emotionally for people to unpack. Um, I have a heart. I have a heart for the community. Uh, that's just always been my passion. I have a heart for human trafficking. Like it's, it's been making me more emotional. So instead of uh, just talking about it and just which is nothing wrong with using your social media platform or whatever platform you may have access to. I am an artist. So if I can use it in my writing, just to talk about little girls and little boys that are so constantly um, through various vices, whether it be online or on the street, like that's important. And how can each of us somehow tie together being on this panel, I do take it as a privilege and an honor to be a part of something like this with us women, because you know, we get it done. <laughs> but um, it's important for us to talk about it. We don't have the same culture background. We don't come from the same place. We don't come from the same neighborhood, but we believe and stand on something. So it's important for us to connect with community builders. If you are not able to go out and serve and go out and give, there's plenty of opportunity for you to connect yourself with the organization. I believe that there is no excuse with, at this day and age. Um, like you said uh, earlier, you can contact someone if there's any language barriers. There are people that can help you go through the census. You have access to the library. Everyone has social media. There's something that you can do. And if you do not use your voice, you're not using your rights as a citizen. Some people are not able to use their voice. And we should not take it for granted. And I believe that whatever happens after the fact, you don't really have 
I would say the permission to speak so boldly because you didn't activate your vo voice, you didn't activate your vo uh, your vote. So that's that's my perspective as an artist. Um, I'd like to chime in just real quick. I, I think, you know, Crystal, I, I really am having, you know, as I grow in my work and, and do this work, uh, you know, more and more and get into it, I think I, I have a real more uh, appreciation of how arts can bring in a completely different audience. Um, so oftentimes we speak to the same people. Yeah. Um, we speak to the people who already kind of agree with you. It's hard to get to those diverse audiences and and kind of the spaces I work in, um, the Asian American space, the South Asian space, um, we're not a monolith, right? So 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 folks that really can make the change that we're trying to inspire, um, we have to think a little bit outside of the box. And and so to that end, uh, we actually worked with a uh, Kavali group this year. Um, it's called Rayaz Kavali. Uh, Ria knows, you know, she was involved with the project. And um, Kavali is a form of music, a uh, traditional form of music, very popular in South Asia. Uh, it's a Sufi devotional music. Uh, if you grew up in a South Asian home, you've probably heard it. My dad was a real just lover of Kavali music. I grew up with it. And what we had was we had Rias Kavali um, do a uh, video. And it was a traditional um, poem set to music. But it was about the day of judgment, right? Like it was about like the chaos that will happen. Um, you know, these are like religious devotional songs. And, but what the video showed was the pandemic and how COVID hits home to this one particular family. Now, on the surface, it doesn't really seem like a, a political message per se, but um, what it did do was allow us to have a conversation with folks about the effects of COVID on our communities and how it's hurting us. And what is it that we can do in order to get some change um, in terms of uh, making our communities safer, um, making sure that our communities are surviving and thriving. And so, so I think that, you know, I, again, like the more I, 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 I do this work, the more I realize we need to start thinking how it is we can get to folks that maybe would not be as um, susceptible to a message of getting involved, that message that you spoke about so beautifully, Crystal. Um, and I think arts has to play a really important role in that. Um, and, and it's through collaboration and uh, through events like these that we can, you know, some of us organizers um, and activists that are on the ground can, can come together with artists um, and really push this narrative that it is on us to really save us. Right. So um, I just think it's really beautiful that we're able to do this. And I hope that we continue to build on this. I would like to add what Crystal and Nabila said, because uh, like I said, we are in the middle of Gulf Trend, a very, very, very diverse area. And then in collaboration with the Houston Arts Alliance and Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs, we did this project is called the uh, uh, the Galton Story Trail, and we used the voices of the community. So the children were writing the poetry, and then the artist painted those murals. And art is universal. You know, it takes time for for someone to learn English or um, whatever language they speak. It's it may take some time to get educated, to get acculturated, to learn English. But arts is very universal language and arts is healing. So when people see yes. themselves in that, you know, when they see that they are in the community, they are reflected. And then same thing we did with the um, the same thing we did with the census. We made uh, two murals with the two or or maybe a little uh, three murals with census. And the message was for census. And I think that's what spreads the word faster. And like I said, art and I mean, like everyone is saying that art is something universal and it takes the message much farther than if we talk and if people, people don't understand. But then those murals and the art projects stay there and they talk to the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to chime in on that. And 
I'm going to echo every, like everything that all of you have been saying, like art is that entry point for those deeper discussions. And they, it, art is um, very humanizing, right? It reflects the social and cultural realities of those, um, of those in that particular location, right? Art has the ability to transform, right? And, you know, again, like everyone has been saying, it's, it's, it's another form of language, right? It's the ability to connect to your emotions, your mind, um, and to really critically think about, you know, the next steps. It's, uh, it's also to remember, to reimagine um, what our community can look like, right? So, um, uh, what, what to start with, but I know that, you know, since COVID, OCA has been, um, I'm, I'm in the arts and storytelling committee as well on, on OCA. So we've been doing like a series of projects. Um, one, we're doing a, um, a film discussion on, you know, featuring films on racial justice, um, highlighting Freedom Summer, highlighting the Delano Monos, but, but centering community dialogue and conversation um, based on the films that are being shown. Um, that's, that's one project. Um, another is called, very much linked to uh, the accounting. Um, we did in May, to, like a year ago, uh, where it's called AAPI Voices. We highlighted the voices of uh, Paraland High School students and Cypress High School students um, because we wanted to encourage um, more diversity on the school board, right? So that's one of our performance, uh, a debrief after a performance. So basically we had statistics in Paraland um, on the different like uh, API folks in Paraland. And then we had a QR code, which connected to those voices um, onto a, a Tumblr site. So folks can um, hear um, the experiences within of API youth in school. And they, after um, saying their experience, they had they had the final sentence of "Do you see me?" So art has a way of like, you know, reaching out and highlighting stories that are not usually heard, right? Um, so yeah, <laughs> it, art is art stays like what um, Dr. Siddiqui said. Like lo art is able to impact. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think also I just wanted to just highlight the fact that really the census is, is um, if we think of what the census is, it, it's almost like it's a reflection of the wonderful diverse communities um, of, of all of America, right? So so when we are all counted, and, and I know we were talking about, you know, some kind of the challenges we had, but we also had very a lot of successes. Um, we came together as a community. We worked together to make sure that everyone knew about the census. And what, what came out of that was this beautiful tapestry of, of different communities, making sure that they were part of the fabric that, that makes up all of America. And that fabric is changing. Um, and that census is also changing. That census, the census of 2020, it's going to look very different from the census of 2010, which is looking very different from 2000. Um, so there's something really beautiful about that because it's a reflection of us. And um, for many people that were not reflected in, in a lot of um, important works, important uh, political narratives uh, and, and important uh, initiatives. Um, so I almost look at the, look at the census as uh, being a reflection or a quilt that 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 shows the diverse communities that make up our our beautiful country and our beautiful city. True, very true. Most definitely. Um, oh, we have a comment here. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, I guess one thing I've been thinking about as all of you are talking is um, going back a little bit to the initiative that we have, which is Beyond Cam. So all of the art that we're talking about is not in a museum. 
And um, I'm so fascinated by that and curious just, um, I read today a quote about how um, artists are put in the position to hold society accountable. And um, I'm curious how all of you, you know, the response that you're hearing in your communities to, for example, Dr. Aisha, the, um, the murals that you're talking about, the Gulfton Trail murals and um, Nabila, I know that, you know, there was a mural that we showed earlier. Um, so I'm just curious about, you know, this artwork that's out in the community where you're talking about this performance, you know, how people are responding to that and how that is getting them engaged in ways that um, is beyond the walls of the museum. Well, for the murals that um, we had shown one mural, there's actually five of them all across the city. And uh, you know, one thing that um, some folks did was they did a bike um, kind of like a bike route amongst awesome. five um, murals, and then they documented it on um, their social media channels. So it's interactive. It, it makes things a little bit more um, fun, and it allows us to kind of start thinking about things in a, in a little bit of a different perspective. Um, the response to um, the murals has been great. Um, but I can speak more specifically about um, the Kawali, the musical performance that, that we did. Um, you know, it's just, look, we're a small nonprofit. <laughs> we, you know, we, we work really hard. We have enough of a following. We don't have the following that these artists do. <laughs> so just by having that, um, that, that video on a YouTube channel that has like four times the following that we do allows us to kind of push our message out to folks that we just would not have access to, right? Like it just, um, those are people that um, that we probably are not targeting because we are not, we don't have a relationship with them. Um, and and they're, they're folks that we, we really want the message to go out. Kind of all of us live in our little silos, um, but we know that our community is wide. And, and so I was really appreciative of this um, collaboration because it it allows us to go into spaces that we wouldn't normally go to and and reach people that we wouldn't normally have um, have the ability to reach to. And then one very good point that Nabila just raised is collaboration. So with these kind of projects, uh, there was no way that we would have worked with so many people and so many organizations if it wasn't for the collaboration. And I think that's the beauty of it. Before that, a lot of people wouldn't know what's going on in Gulfton or what population, what kind of, what people, what immigrants, refugees who live there. And same thing with the organizations who have not worked there, but just by collaborating and working with each other, we kind of opened so many doors that were not open before. So that's also a very, very important thing that be it poetry, be it mural, be it Kavali, be it any kind of art, because we also work in photo photography. So it's just that collaboration brings people together and then it makes uh, the whole new fabric and the whole new tapestry, like you said. And then Houston is, I think, very unique in that. And I think uh, a lot of cities in America can learn from Houston that the way we are doing these things is model. So I think that's another uh, thing that we are doing with these kind of projects. Um, so you, you guys are saying, or all, the, the question was like beyond CAM, right? And the impact beyond, beyond like the walls or just what's happening in public spaces, right? So I'm gonna refer back to uh, that um, summer project for a minute because that evolved, right? So initially, again, I'm gonna you know, reiterate just a little bit, like it was particularly um, a project in Pearland, right? And it was a collaboration between uh, Donna Kim Murphy, um, I'm gonna name my folks as well, like Trisha Morales, Christian Toledo, uh, Jenna Maravilla, right? And some, again, the high school students. And so the thing was, you know, representing, and if you look at the school board, like it doesn't reflect the diversity of Maryland. And so we wanted 
to encourage like the entire you know city to um you know to vote and to realize like how diverse pearland was and so again like i explained like we were disrupted um at the height of traffic we had like a pair of students like hold up statistics and this qr code right and along and with that the link to the voices so in so and the link to the voices was very much like wow like this is this is my my uh, my daughter and my son's story like um we had one mother listen to it and saying wow this sounds like my daughter and so when you are able to like pair the voice with you know again what is happening and the representation right the lack of representation like it makes it makes you question it makes you uh, critically think about what's ha what's happening around you um and so how that evolved even further was um you know, in, in a Uniport Texas like programming, like we always try to, again, mesh um, or have dialogue, have that dialogue between arts and civic engagement too, right? And so how, we have an art showcase every year. And so one of our questions was, okay, so how can we shed light on these, on the youth, youth voices again, once more? And so we actually used um, the Houston census data on AAPI census data, um and we helped put them up on panels and then we connected the voices once more so as folks were listening to thank you as folks were listening they got to see and understand um and connect um with the voices and realize you know um you know our community so but and also juxtaposed to that wall was um the older gen the pictures of the older generation so that it was that nice like i guess cohesive moment um in the in the showcase and we're still accepting voices by the way um yeah so um and also i'm going to highlight on october 24th um again reiterating this, this film um series and, and community dialogue um on october 24th um and it's uh, the month of October is also um, Filipino American History Month. So uh, this is a collaboration between FXAH or excuse me, Philippine Artists of Houston, um, FON, uh, Filipino National Historical Society, Unipro, and OCA. So um, we are specifically highlighting the film Delano Mano, which is actually um, the Delano highlights the Delano Grape Strike. And so that was um, a moment in history that we wanted to highlight because, you know, it was in the strike, uh, you know, related to the Filipino and and uh, Latino like migrant workers, right? And we're centering, so that was an act of collective resistance. And so we, in in knowing our history, we know ourselves, and in highlighting these stories um, historically. And then linking them, like, excuse me, linking them to the actual migrant stories. Now, um, we're actually going to unpack that more in a panel. So again, art and film and you know music can be an entry point to further discussions relating to the issues and the concerns happening in your communities now. So yes, I just wanted to share that bit. So. Yeah, and the communities see themselves in that. They see, oh, it's me. Absolutely. Yes. You know, that's the biggest thing is like they see themselves in that and they say, oh, it's me. It relates to me or it represents me. Sorry, I don't want to. <laughs> just uh, I wanted to add just a little bit. Um, it is important, like it was saying, for the youth, like the youth really does have a lot of input. They have a lot of things to say. I just believe no one is really paying attention or listening because of how it's delivered. And then when it comes to music, film and the arts, they will be able to express themselves and use that to connect with other youth because the future is set up for the next generation. So being able to find a common ground, even for them, it works. <laughs> it honestly works. Uh, I was working with MFV this summer and we did, uh, we were discussing um, the, how do they feel, how do students feel going back to school? Like, you know, no one is really asking students, do they feel safe? Them going back home to their families, um, if they get sick, you know, and the demographic of who's being affected from these school districts. And so we went back over at the, uh, the preamble and we did, uh, we, the, we the students type of, um, 
I get not reenactment, but we rewrote it for from their perspective. And I think it's awesome. Um, that's something that I would like to evolve into something else and 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 make it a trend or a hashtag because a lot of students still have an issue with going back to school and they do have a voice in what's going on politically. Um, but if you can find like anything dealing with the arts, film, something to get their attention, something that's interesting, it, it really does help. And if we could really continue this work together, working with other uh, organizations and specifically targeted to maybe their background, you will be amazed on the improvement that you will see uh, socially and politically as well. Um, I wanted to, you know, a lot of you are talking about um, projects and works that you've done with students. And um, one thing, you know, just maybe a little plug on my end, um, we at CAM have um, a contest going on. It's called Voice Your Choice, and it's for 13 to 17 year olds to submit um, an original work of art. There's some prize money to encourage people to vote, and it's specifically for 13 to 17 year olds because they can't vote and their voice, you know, doesn't get to be included. And so, you know, kind of thinking about all of these things and how they connect i'm just curious you know you've all spoken about these projects where you've worked with um a lot of you have worked with students who you know don't get to vote right now you know hopefully they will in the future and we can make sure that they're feeling engaged and activated but um just you know how are you know these students that you're working with feeling in this moment and um how do we get them you know, kind of civically engaged because, you know, this is the next generation who's so important to all of us. I'm just curious about that from all of you. So I get really excited when I start talking about young people. Um, and the reason is uh, they get it. I mean, they get it in a way that sometimes um, it's really hard to, to um, talk to other, uh, age demographics. Um, this was the summer of protest. This was the summer where everybody got out of their house and came to the streets and said, we have to change. Something is wrong. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter. This is not right. And, um, and so seeing that, um, and then with the proliferation of social media, uh, I have two daughters that are in high school. They, uh, you know, they they have an understanding of of the the way the system is is working in a way that I never knew before, and um, and just talking to young people, ha making letting them know that this is what they can do, um, and seeing how receptive they are is 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 really um, uh, inspiring. Now, what I will say. It also has its challenges. So I remember being in a protest uh, during this crazy summer and being with some young people. And I said, well, why don't we bring the voter registration form since we're already going to be there and let's register um, people uh, at the protest. And the response I got from these college age students that I was with was like, this isn't the moment. This is not the moment for you to talk about voter registration. And of course, in my mind, I was like, this is the exact moment. There's a lot of people in one place. Let's register voters. So there has to be like uh, education uh, combined with passion, and and that is is I think imperative. Uh, what I think we need to do is make sure that we are building a pipeline of ethical leaders that will take over once all of us are gone. And um, and that to me is is it weighs heavy on my shoulders. And I hope uh, we, we are able to, to do that um, through some of the wonderful programs everyone is doing here, through their organizations. We have our own youth leadership programs. Um, when I was growing up, I never knew that um, becoming politically active was an option. I never knew that this was a thing that could happen. Um, I didn't know you could become a city council person or a mayor. I never even met those people. I just want to make sure that 
folks that come from what we would call in the census, the undercounting communities do know that, that they know that this is a viable option, that this is open to them and that there is a door and they can take it and turn the handle and go through that door. And so that's what I'm committed to do. And I know many of us on this call are also committed to that. It's a very good point, Nabila, and also because I am the person who hated politics. You know, I always thought that politics is not for me and politicians are different people and I am just living my peaceful life and I just don't want to be involved. But the problem is that people like me are naive and they don't know that it it is impacting me directly. It's not that I am choosing between Republican or Democrat or independent or anything. At the end of the day, it's what's on the table. And if we are not there, then that's the problem because the decisions are being made by politicians. If we don't find representation, then obviously we will not be, uh, we, we will not get or we will not get our rights, we will not get what we are supposed to. So it's not politics, it's not about being in the White House or being in the uh, city hall or something. Politics is about our daily life, our day-to-day -day life. It's our, ab about our own homes, about it has to be at our dining tables, not some other special place. So that's what people need to understand, be it the young people, be it the refugees, be it the immigrants, that Politics is not something that is out of our norms. This is something that we all should know so we can make the right decisions or we know what needs to be done um, in this day and time and in future. Any other thoughts? I'm, I understand that like we, yes, we do work with youth um, and particularly for us, like I know I, I, we work with college students, but I feel like, you know, in, you know, unpacking our identity and our, and realizing our cultural wealth, which is important, it's also to, uh, we also use art performance to loop in um, the conversation with the adults as well. So having intergenerational conversations, um, you know, among and with our community and, you know, with the LGBTQIA, like being very inclusive in that will make um, will make it so much. Yes, it, it's good. It's it's going to be. Excuse me. It's going to be a difficult and hard time to have those conversations, but that's only necessary if we want to move forward, right? Because yes, the youth has the energy, but the older folks who've had so much more experience have something to say. And if we're able to meet in the middle um, through those, like you know, brave and safe spaces, then I think that's where we can also, you know, move forward, right? So I just wanna say that. Um, I think I think if it's, it's, it's something like if we are not at the table, we are on the table. So it's something like mm -hmm. that, that if we are not there, then mm -hmm. someone else will make decisions and we are involved in those decisions. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I agree. I believe it, it's important to bridge the gap um, from the youth now gaining an understanding of what's going on. And then, like you said, from the older generation, being able to right. explain their experiences so we can create better <laughs> experiences, better uh, legacies, I would say. And um, it was another thought that slipped my mind, <laughs> but it's important. Um, I love the, the different uh, perspectives that we've taken to educate one another in different groups. And one thing I would say, especially with the uh, election going on right now, being able to be politically um, literate and knowing who and what we're standing on. Um, and like you said, creating those safe places for us to be able to talk about things, regardless if you agree with different groups or different backgrounds, we should talk about it. Like we, it's a lot to discuss, you can't, just throw out the baby with the bathwater. Like this, there's so much going on in the world that I believe everyone can benefit or come to some type of common ground. But for whatever reason, in us being human beings, we are often divided. Um, but we honestly are fighting for the same thing. We're fighting for justice. We're fighting for equality to be included. To there's so many voices that are here, especially in Houston. There's so much diversity, 
And it's important to hear from each group. And I've been, if being on social media, especially during the pandemic, it's been so amazing to see the different cultures that you really don't know about um, using that platform to talk about different things. And I want us to continue to do so with the film industry. Me personally, that's something that I'm going to start uh, highlighting using film to talk about racial injustices through, um, you know, different films of color. Um, I was talking to someone about Candyman. I said, did anyone realize that Candyman died because he was dating a white woman? Like that was a racial thing that happened. And even though it was a horror film, like let's talk about that. It's it's little things that you can t can talk about and discuss and just, again, creating those um, platforms and those safe spaces and panel discussions, like those things are very important that we dismiss. So I'm all for it. I definitely would love to work with you ladies in the future. If you guys are open to it, um, just want to push the envelope on that one. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it. <laughs> well, we, um, we're leaving everybody with lots of homework tonight, right? So we are going to do another plug and reminder, you know, there's a couple more hours where everybody can fill out the census. We're going to tell everybody that they need to go and vote. If you're in Texas right now, it's early voting. So we're just going to, you know, do our plug for that. And then I'm going to do my plug again for accounting. Um, the project, again, as we mentioned at the top, um, by the artist Ekene Ijeoma. Um, we want all of your voices included. Please, it just takes five minutes to call. Um, so those are my plugs. I would love to hear, you know, what all of you are up to, what's coming next for all of you. Um, if you have any thoughts about the work accounting, you know, definitely have a couple more minutes where we can talk about that as well. Minutes. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to add a little bit more to the conversation we were just having a second ago. And I was like, you know, I, I actually don't like politics either, which is I'm in a strange field. But I think for many of us, we don't have a choice, right? Like this is an existential crisis for communities of color, for people that are come from low income backgrounds, from vulnerable communities. Um, and so, um, not being political is almost like a political act in itself. And so we mm. have no choice but mm -hmm. to um, make sure that we are fighting for our communities because I want my kids and my kids' kids and my kids' kids to be here. The reason my parents came to this part of the world was looking for a better life. Um, but we're in a we're in, in a state where I'm not sure if that's going to be possible. Um, the way things are going right now. So so we don't have a choice but to be political. Um, and so having said that, I think working with other communities of color um, is, is the way forward and is what we have to do. Um, I love using the umbrella of Asian American um, only because it covers and encompasses a whole wide range of cultures and ethnicities. Um, and it allows us to unite and use that power. So I'm taking up a lot of time and stop. Uh, in terms of plugging, uh, we're just phone banking and we are texting. And if you want to help us, we are just calling low propensity voters, those voters that are registered, but for some reason are not going to the polls, the one that all everyone ignores, well, those are the ones we're calling and we're nudging them to go to the polls. So if you want to join us, please um, visit our website, engageusa.org, and we can we can uh, hook you up and, and get you to volunteer and help us. Anyone else have anything coming up? that they want to just mention before we sign off here? Oh, we do Facebook live sessions. So our next one is with the uh, state representative, Gene Wu, and he's coming tomorrow to talk to us. And um, that's our ongoing uh, program. And we do it every two weeks. So um, it's Facebook live on Fridays at 3 p.m. And then next one is coming up tomorrow. Yeah, so I'm uh, also plug in a little bit of um, OCA because I know that we're doing some ongoing like programming, like in terms of like the arts and storytelling. So um, what's upcoming is a the October 24th event um, again celebrating like the 
Filipino American community um, for this month. Um, and that will be located at Leaf Art, Art House. Um, and what's beautiful is that it's again, also accessible because it's, a, it's located in Spark Park, at least Spark Park, yes, there you go. Um, and, you know, the artist in charge of um, a Leaf Art House is Matt Manalo. Um, shout out to Matt. Um, so that's, we're doing a little programming there. And then, it, like I mentioned before, highlighting the film Delano Manong. Um, Starry Night Fest is, half, is in December. Um, I know that it's a, it's a collaboration uh, with all different sorts of artists. Um, so just keep in mind um, of that. Um, and visit the OCA uh, Greater Houston website for more information on voting. Um, yeah. Uh, lastly, <laughs> I will be uh, working on a project dealing with human trafficking this month uh, using all elements of the art. So if you are a painter, writer, poet, um, please, please, please contact me. Um, this will be a continual passion project. So this will be the start this month. And I also start my movie night on uh, October 31st. <laughs> so uh, if you I don't have everything up and ready, that's going to be uh, starting tomorrow for promotion, but you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Black Beauty, B-L-A-Q-U-E-B-U-E-A-T-I. And I think the community day is coming for Lee, so we are planning to have some music and dance and a stage there during that time when we distribute the art kits. And yeah. I'm sure you can talk more about it. <laughs> yes, thank you for that last yeah. reminder. Yeah. So um, collaborating with you. Yes, love all these collaborations. So um, as CAM is still closed, we are going to um, experiment a little bit. And on Saturday, October 31st, CAM is celebrating our 72nd anniversary. Ooh. And I know. <laughs> and we are having a citywide event where we are encouraging people to safely come and visit four different places. So one of them is in Gulfton, chat, um, CAM, uh, Houston Public Library, the location TBD, stay tuned, <laughs> and the East and um, Studio Galleries. And um, at several of the, at three of those locations, um, you can pick up an art kit and there will be activations, Ooh. whether that is a performance or something else. So something that you can kind of come by and see, there'll be directions for the project. Um, it's all free, um, you know, and kind of my last thing that I always say is, you know, follow Cam on social media, sign up for our e-newsletter, check our calendar for all of our upcoming events because we have so many things going on. Even if our doors aren't open, we're still, you know, here in the virtual space and um, slowly thinking about, you know, the outside space and, um, you know, wanting to continue to engage with our community and all of these amazing partners and um, be in conversation with artists. So um, again, thank you all so much for being here, our panelists, to anybody who tuned in um, please go vote, fill out the census, call the accounting hotline. Your voice matters. We need to hear it. You need to get counted. So those are my last um, moments. Oh, these are my parents. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, we appreciate all of you. And um, yes, we will you know, be in touch and can't wait to welcome you all back at CAM soon. Thanks for having us. It was awesome. Thank right. you for having us. Have a good night. Good night.